Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us today uh, for this 10th episode of the Armin Barr Young Lawyers Committee's uh, series of webinars. So we're currently on episode 10. My name is Narek Funjan. I'll be your host today. Um, this is part two of a series on cybersecurity and privacy. Uh, and I'm joined today by three uh, outstanding practitioners in the area. Um, I'll make quick intros and then I'll, I'll forward off to them to, uh, to lead the ball. First, we have Migan, who's a polyglot privacy advocate and lawyer called to the bar in Ontario, New York, and the District of Columbia. She's a senior program manager at the TELUS Data and Trust Office, where she advises on privacy and data ethics with a focus on enterprise cloud services and artificial intelligence initiatives. We also have Christian Ohanya, who's Senior Counsel for Privacy and Cybersecurity at MasterCard. Previously, he served as Assistant General Counsel with the National Security Agency. We also have Arsene Kurinyan, who's a partner at Mayor and Brown in, Los Angeles, uh, in their Los Angeles office and a member of the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice. You see the theme coming up. Arsene advises multinational corporations regarding compliance with data privacy laws in the US, European Union, United Kingdom, Africa, Middle East, and Asia. So we're really lucky to be joined by these three outstanding individuals. Uh, also, just one, one boring thing be before we get into the fun facts about, um, about our three panelists. Uh, there will be comments. Uh, in, the, in the comment section, you'll find all the information you need for continuing legal education credits. So for those who are attending to get those credits, we'll keep an eye out in the chat. So without further ado, um, We'll start in the order that I presented. Uh, you can tell us what did I miss in the intro, and do you want to complement that with a fun fact? Fun fact that's always challenging. Um, I, when I was younger, I thought I would go to the Olympics for Taekwondo. That never happened. I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. So now I settle for watching UFC fights here and there. I also, um, I, I regularly swim. Uh, two weeks ago, I, I went to the World Cup and watched our summer Macintosh beat the U.S. legendary Katie Ledecky. So that was fun for me. <laughs> Christian? Uh, so I guess, fun fact, I'll go with, I um, love music. I play guitar. I On one of my trips to Armenia, I tried to learn how to play a duduk, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for people who can play it because it's incredibly difficult, and I definitely never learned how to play a duduk, but it, um, I, yeah, that is, uh, I guess that's what I will go with for my fun fact. Uh, my fun fact, um, avid hockey enthusiast, I should have lived in, been born in Canada. Um, and I also do a lot of weightlifting and uh, cardio workouts. Uh, it's one of my hobbies. Wonderful. So clearly, we have um, multifaceted practitioners, but they all have in common that they're passionate about what they do outside of work, but also they share, uh, they share that they work in cybersecurity and data privacy, which is what you're here for today. So maybe we can... Uh, Migan, you want to open the the stage with with Canada because we'll start with we'll start with the minority position. Uh, we have two two practitioners in the U.S. one one from Canada. Do you want to do you want to start situating us with some of the the key principles? Like what's 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 privacy all about in Canada? And then you know maybe we can talk a bit about how it works in the U.S. What the what the system is there like? For sure, I, I'm happy to kick it off. So if I were to ask the participants what privacy means to them, I think we will get a range of answers. So you might say privacy means freedom. It means I get to decide what happens to my information. It means the government leaves me alone or my neighbor isn't spying on me. And if we were to sort of gather and group these uh, responses, we'd probably get three main groups. So you would get the rights of the individual vis-a-vis -vis governments, the rights of the individual vis-a-vis -vis other people, strangers, um, neighbors, and the last group would be the rights of the individual vis-a-vis -vis corporations. And that's the context in which we are, at least I am speaking uh, mostly about. So with that context of the rights of the individual vis-a-vis -vis corporations, 
that leads to Canada's federal privacy laws. So Canada has federal privacy legislation. The US does not have that. And the way it works is that the federal privacy legislation is supposed to apply across the board. Yet there is a rule that says if a province has passed its own privacy law that has been deemed to be substantially similar to the federal one, then the private, then the provincial one will apply. The federal law is called Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, short form PIPEDA or PIPEDA. And to give you an example to situate this, so if I'm a business, I'm, I'm in Ontario, so if I'm running a business in Ontario, um, there's no private sector privacy law in Ontario. We, we want one, we're working on one, we've started consultations, but we don't have it. It means that the business that I'm running and, and uh, the rules that will apply to what I can and cannot do with customer information will be governed by the, the federal one. Okay, but in the US, there's no federal law, right? Arsene, do you wanna tell us how that works? Yeah, there's no federal comprehensive privacy law, although there is sectoral laws. So for example, if you're offering a financial product in your financial institution, um, the Graham Leach Blightly Act applies, which is the federal sectorial privacy law um, for credit monitoring. We have the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the FCRA. Um, for healthcare data, we have HIPAA. So there's fragmented sort of federal sectoral laws, uh, but for comprehensive privacy laws, sort of like Canada's PIPEDA, um, that really is on a state level. So California uh, was groundbreaking in that it passed the first uh, comprehensive privacy law in the U.S. in uh, 2018. It went to effect in 2020, the CCPA, you may have heard. Um, and then subsequently, um, last year, or well, this year, um, four other states passed privacy laws that go into effect next year in Utah, Colorado, uh, Virginia, and Connecticut. Um, and so what we're seeing is a patchwork of state privacy laws that address this need for a comprehensive privacy law. Um, however, we're anticipating there to be more states to pass these laws. And the good news is that a lot of these state comprehensive privacy laws are very similar. So it's allowing for a harmonized approach throughout the United States, um, except for Canada, uh, excuse me, California, which has some call outs um, in comparison to those other states. And then, of course, we have also the patchwork of uh, data breach notification laws, which probably is uh, Christian's uh, domain there, uh, but uh, on the cyber side. Um, yeah, what does what does that look like? And uh, you know, a little bit maybe, Chris, on the on the cyber side. And then, if you want to tell us, you know, you're at you're at Mastercard, and I'm sure Mastercard is a global company, so you 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 get to see all kinds of privacy legislation. What you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So on the data breach side of things, you have you have a complex kind of system that's developed at the at the federal and the state level. At the state level, like Arson was was speaking of, you have each state has a, a data breach notification framework with varying timelines for when you're required to report a data breach and various conditions that surround, hey, what kind of data may be involved in a breach that would then trigger your responsibilities. Um and then you also, especially in the financial sector, you have rules that have come down from federal banking regulators that apply to banking institutions directly about what kinds of responsibilities they have to report breaches. The New York Department of Financial Services has been really groundbreaking um, in terms of the institutions that it's responsible for regulating on the cybersecurity side with respect to both breach notification requirements and a variety of other requirements that they have. Um, and and those state privacy schemes that Arson was referring to, they have themselves security requirements that, that are kind of embedded within them in a similar way to the, you know, kind of like you said, coming from a, you know, my position where I have kind of a global responsibility, I'm looking at the GDPR, I'm looking at what's going on in Canada. And similarly, a lot of privacy schemes globally have that kind of Venn diagram overlap with cybersecurity because in so many places, including the European Union and elsewhere, some of the most important security requirements, they will come from a privacy scheme. You know, the, you know, the privacy scheme may deal with other things as well, but they'll also often have at least some 
significant part of it that relates to security requirements. The other thing I would say on the U.S. level, which is which is an interesting component to what you know, tying back to what Megan was was discussing, was we also have a set of laws that we don't always think of as privacy, but they are privacy protective. When you think of things like the Wiretap Act and some other laws that are almost more oriented to the criminal side, not exclusively though. I mean, there are civil remedies under a lot of those laws that relates to the interception of you know, uh, communications, the content of communications and things of that nature. That's a, of course, has a privacy component to it. And it applies to companies as well in terms of whether it's their corporate security practices, or maybe even if you're a tech company, maybe even some kind of product you're building, it potentially could become implicated with those laws. We don't always think of them as privacy related because for a long time, they were parked more in the kind of criminal enforcement area and, and often can be the subject of you know, the Department of Justice or other kinds of um, enforcement in that space. But it kind of contributes to that patchwork that, that our son was referring to of, of uh, laws that relate to privacy. If you guys had to, I mean, we'll maybe let you let you intervene. What's what's the top privacy principle that comes out? You know, what's the one that you, you get to hear about in your practice all the time? Like our audience might not know. You know, we're talking about privacy. We're talking about cybersecurity. What's what's the ones that come up all the time that you feel are are key and that our, our audience should remember going home today? Um, I would say transparency. I mean, obviously, there's different information fair information practices act transparency is just one of many but i think that's the one thing that gets companies in trouble is when they're not transparent about their practices and part of transparency also involves transparency about what rights uh, consumers or data subjects are entitled to um and so anytime you're going to do anything with personal information just make sure you tell the individual what what information you're collecting from them why you're collecting it who you're going to share it with and what their rights are and I think that will get you significantly um, advanced in your privacy maturity level. But of course, there's other facets that I'm sure my colleagues here will, will discuss. So I can speak from the Canadian perspective. So our PIPEDA, the federal privacy law, I see it as just a principle-based law. And that's perhaps why it's been able to survive for so long without uh, uh, being amended much. I know now we're trying to, to amend our, our, our privacy laws. And in schedule one of, of our PIPEDA, we have the fair information principles. So those are 10 principles that tend to um, overlap. So principles like uh, accountability, um, individual access, um, security safeguards, limiting disclosure, limiting use, retention, um, challenging compliance. So I would say if I had to pick one, I would probably say, um, I know accountability, uh, transparency is taken, perhaps uh, limiting uh, retention. So that would be, in, in other words, in, in European lingo, it would be data minimization. And that comes in, into um, play a lot in, in, in breach situations. The idea being that you shouldn't hold on to data longer than you actually need. And this actually comes up in a lot of the privacy commissioner's reports and recommendations when they do investigations. Uh, the reason is, you know, the company held on to data that they no longer needed, then they experienced a hack, and now they have to deal with the aftermath, notifications, and, and dealing with um, all, all that jazz afterward. For me, I, I like the transparency concept, and, and it, but even from another angle, which is in the cybersecurity space, um, it, it is one of those areas where it doesn't always have to, but can often result in a little bit of tension with privacy frameworks because of the fact that to really build a robust kind of cybersecurity ecosystem, you have to be able to share information um, and you have to be able to share cyber threat indicators, whether it's an IP address that might be connected to a malicious actor or an email address that your corporate security department or, or maybe another organization needs to know about so that they can protect themselves. And so I think it would possibly fall into the transparency bucket because it kind of relates to that concept of you need to be transparent about what you're doing with data, how you're sharing it, how you may share it, how you may use it. Um, and I think that even relates to publicly available information, which is an incredibly important source of um, information that enables, it's not the only source, but it's a very important source that it enables um, network defenders and other cybersecurity companies to be armed with information to actually be able to defend themselves. But 
it can often also be personal information that is subject to a variety of privacy laws. So there can be a little bit of a back and forth there. There doesn't have to be, that doesn't have to be an unworkable, you know, solution or place to be in, but it it is, it is one of those areas I am, you know, kind of involved in, in focusing on. And I think we'll all have to continue to keep an eye on going forward because we won't be able to, I think, functionally build the most kind of secure networks that we want without sharing information. But then when we're dealing with sharing information on that flip side, we have to make sure that the right privacy protections are, are observed. Yeah, and just wanted to add, I so I want to make sure that I share this with you because it's important to me. So our fair information principles, the 10 principles, they're often positioned as the only principles that we have in Canada. But I want to also direct your attention to uh, principles of Indigenous communities. So they have their own principles. It's called OCAP. Um, it's um, ownership, control, access, and possession. So just be aware that that does exist as well. And you can learn more about um, OCAP if you just uh, Google it and, it and know that it's it's for the Indigenous communities to assert. It's not for, for example, for us to adopt. That's super interesting. And just curious, is there something similar in the US or is this a Canadian indigenous community thing? How, do, how does? I don't think there's something similar in the US. Of course, uh, there are sort of sovereign nations in the US for the, the native community where they have certain reservations and their own rights and obligations and rules. Um, I don't think there are comprehensive privacy laws in these regions. Um, so I don't think there's an equivalent there in the US. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a trick question. Uh, maybe it's a bit of a trick question. I'm gonna ask everybody to to open their mics, and I want all of you to answer at the same time. And you can answer. It depends. Are you a privacy or cybersecurity lawyer? Go. Privacy. Privacy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. We have two privacy lawyers, and Chris, I heard both. Yeah. I would say that's, I'd say that's the most accurate description for me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then let's, let's start with the privacy folks. Um, Megan, you want to tell us what a privacy lawyer does on a, on a day to day? Like what, what is a privacy lawyer? Cause okay, these laws exist. What do you do? So my, my role day to day is, is quite unique in that. Yes, I'm a privacy lawyer, but I'm working in the data and trust office. So I, I work very closely with the teams that are um, deploying uh, services, um, creating products from the sales team, marketing team to, um, to the leaders, cybersecurity team, uh, the security team. Um, a lot of uh, privacy impact assessments, a review of um, AI systems for responsible AI principles. Um, there is a lot of also negotiations with uh, again, a lot of our cloud providers from a privacy perspective, redlining the standard stuff that we uh, think lawyers do. Um, again, before joining TELUS, I, I, I worked uh, in, a, in a firm that just did uh, strictly privacy law. And there, a lot of my work was drafting these documents or so drafting privacy policies, drafting terms of use. Um, and again, doing privacy impact assessments, doing due diligence for um, pre-post acquisitions. Um, so that sort of thing. And then Arsen, how, how does your you know practice kind of complete that year? Because because Megan is in-house at TELUS, you're you're in private practice. So I'm yeah. guessing it's a little bit different. Yeah, I mean I do do about 20% cyber also, but a lot of my bread and butter is privacy. Um, I think the main function of my job is client counseling. Um, so a lot of phone calls every day, a lot of uh, uh, counseling sessions where I advise them on how to comply with the privacy laws. Um, a lot of times the companies will have an in-house uh, privacy attorney sometimes, sometimes they don't, um, but there's a rapidly changing privacy laws, not only in the U.S., but also internationally, there's over 150 privacy laws. So a lot of our clients reach out saying we need a solution for all of the countries we operate in, which could be a challenge. And so a lot of it is just strategic counseling on how to implement a, a program that would comply with all these privacy laws. And I usually walk clients through what I call the six phases of privacy compliance, 
which is based on the French Data Protection Authority's uh, guidance related to the steps you need to take for compliance. Um, another facet of my job, other than just general privacy compliance internationally, is also board and C-suite counseling. Um, so there is, a, you may have followed the news, but board and C-suite members have been facing direct liability for failing to implement internal controls in their company uh, related to data privacy and security issues in their company. And so part of my job is to um, give presentations during audit committee hearings to the board about uh, data privacy and security issues, and then for them to effectively implement those controls within the company so that um, it's sort of like a top to bottom trickle down effect of having the direction from your board uh, relate to privacy issues. And then a third part of my job, which I really love, is the privacy by design stage. Uh, some of my clients are developing like new technologies, vehicles, connected devices, connected cities. And um, this is pre-launch. So they reach out to talk about the design stage, what features they want to implement, and what privacy issues they can foreshadow in advance um, to comply with the privacy laws and also to be privacy protective. Um, and so th that's another facet of my job. Amazing. So, so Chris would call you because he's dealing with global issues. Right. No, I, I think that's right. I mean, that's, and I, I can, I'm totally understand where Arson's coming from in terms of when I'm working with, um, when I'm working with our internal clients, one of the big questions we get as well is how, how do you, you know, how can we best build customer contracts or kind of, uh, you know, when we're in the, the product development stage, which is where I often work with. Um, a lot of our business team on cybersecurity products and, and, and anti-fraud, anti-money laundering products, things of that nature. You know, how do we build these products in a way where we're going to build them to be as consistent as possible globally, while of course respecting all of the various laws in, in the legal, you know, in, in the various jurisdictions to try and create as much consistency as possible, which is is, you know, what I think is is probably the, the best approach. I also would say I, I work on, you know, a lot of things like Megan was describing, but maybe one different, you know, one additional component that I don't know if we've talked a lot about here is we deal with some products too that, you know, conduct some really interesting activities in terms of, um, you know, providing cybersecurity risk assessments and things of that nature. Sometimes you have, you work with products that might have, um, you know, certain, you know, cyber functionality where you need to make sure under various cybersecurity and kind of cyber crime laws that might exist in various jurisdictions, there's some guidance and counseling that's done in that space to ensure that whatever kinds of activities, cyber enabled activities, you know, a various product might be doing performing or a new product, maybe one that's under development to make sure that we're in a good space on um, ensuring that whatever kinds of authorizations we need, whatever kinds of consents you might need in whatever space you're operating in you have so that you don't run afoul of uh, cyber crime laws in a variety of jurisdictions. So that's kind of another kind of a component to to what I work on. And I do work with our corporate security team, you know, at times working on things that, you know, um, to make sure that we have the right, you know, compliance with, with various um, cybersecurity laws and cybercrime laws. That sounds, that sounds great. And I think we got a broad picture of what, you know, you might be doing on a day to day. Um, you know, for, for our audience's sake, what's, what's the things that happen on your coolest days that you go home and you say, I'm really happy to be a cybersecurity slash privacy attorney. Chris, you wanna you wanna kick that off? What's what's the highlight? Yeah, I, honestly, I I think it's it is it's fun, and I wouldn't have said this because I started my career, and I know we haven't you know we may touch on this later. I started my career as a litigator. I was a trial lawyer years and years and years ago, um, and I don't know if I would have said this that in that this many years ago. It, it can be incredibly fun sometimes when we're working on, you know, sometimes even, you know, coming up with a really creative contract, you know, like a solution to a contractual relationship, trying to come up with something that makes sure we're in compliance in, in various legal jurisdictions, but it's it's kind of a major thing that we're trying to move forward and trying to come up with creative contractual language to, to deal with an issue. I'm shocked at how much I actually enjoy working on contracts. I never thought I would say that. Uh, the other thing would I would say is when is when I'm working on a product where it, it is doing some of these really important cyber risk assessments that we're trying to provide to customers that I that I really do believe provides a public good kind of function too to ensure that the whole ecosystem every customer that maybe has the tool is getting information to protect themselves 
that we're, you know, that I'm being able to provide guidance, you know, in real time to say, hey, you know, the thing we're building with this product to ensure that it's operating in a lawful way to be able to really create a solution where it allows the, the business to keep doing what it's doing. Because a lot of those products, I think, and, and I'm sure Megan and Arson feel the same way, they're they're doing more than just kind of uh, suiting a business function. They're helping build an ecosystem that, you know, around the world, it's more secure. So, yeah. That's Whoever's most excited. <laughs> Am I, am I, okay, so um, for me, I, I really love, honestly, I, I love um, the area I work in, and it's, I find it to be very intellectually stimulating. And my academic background is in philosophy. Before I went to law school, I also have my master's degree in philosophy, and I see a lot of similarities, especially when I venture into the AI side of things. Um, I love it when I get to learn. Every day is a learning opportunity, especially when I'm working with um, the, uh, for example, the developers, you know, you, you are looking at, let's say, an architectural diagram and it, it's making sense to you and you're able to flag risks and just be able to um, understand the whole, you know, end to end product um, life cycle. It's really see, it's nice to see that the, the big picture and see how your efforts actually come to fruition. Yeah, I guess uh, the, the most rewarding thing for me is. Uh... I'm I'm very passionate per, on a personal level on data privacy. Uh, I view it as a fundamental human right. And so sometimes when you're counseling different companies, there are it's a bit of a mixed bag of what their perception is on privacy. Sometimes they view it as a hindrance and they just think of ways where it's just a compliance issue and they just need to hit all the marks and comply. Uh, and there's also companies that are very privacy forward. And even if the laws here they want to be here um and it's always rewarding for me when i can really hit home the point to a company that uh privacy is not just a compliance issue it's also a um it's a branding issue it's fundamental for your company to survive um i think you know if you look at some recent news events about companies that have huge market cap hits uh for failing to have adequate sort of data privacy and security uh, measures in place it really underscores the, the importance of privacy. So when I can convince a company that, uh, I feel like it's a big victory and it not only addresses, you know, the human rights aspect to the privacy issue, but also a, an issue that's very important to the company that they need to factor in. Um, and then, you know, a second thing that I, I always get joy out of is when we're when a company I represent is under investigation by a regulator, such as the California Attorney General's office, to be able to provide the counseling that would that they would need to avoid any repercussions and to implement the protocols and processes that they need. Um, and so, yeah, those are the two main things. Never a dull day. I find that you're you're always learning. I'm I'm curious because a lot of you mentioned uh, that that there's some tech related component. You know, looking at diagrams participating in the cybersecurity ecosystem, um, putting, creating privacy by design and, and products, which I, I imagine have some kind of software component. Do, do all of you know how to code? Are you, you know, were you born with a computer in your hands? Are you techie? Are you a geek? Uh, I think that's a, that's a big misconception about data privacy. Uh, I mean, of course, it's it's amazing to have some type of a computer background, coding experience, the whole nine yards. That's all great. Um, I personally don't. Um, I've learned some basics of it just for, out of curiosity. Um, but you know, for anybody that's you know viewing this presentation and you're like a law student maybe looking into getting into the profession, um, don't ever view getting into data privacy as being something that's not for you just because you don't have a technical background. Um, I think there's a lot of people with no technical background that are perfectly fine in this field uh, because the field just deals with certain fundamental principles which um, relate to consumer rights or data subject rights and transparency and other protections. Um, I think what I would say is it's good to have a healthy curiosity um, about technology. Um, like, for example, a big thing that I do is advising about the ad tech ecosystem where cookies are placed uh, on your browser and they track users for targeted advertising. And, um, you know, obviously you don't need to know all the nuances of how the cookie works, but you do need to understand the bigger picture of 
how they operate um, from a privacy standpoint. And just teaching, being willing to teach yourself is very important. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I do not have a technical background at all. I was a history major in college. Um, and like I was mentioning earlier, I started my career as like a standard trial attorney, um, just kind of trying cases, standing up in court, making arguments. I would say the other thing about, you know, I agree with Arsene, don't, I wouldn't let people, you know, if you're listening to this call, you don't see an obstacle to it if you don't have a technical background. And also, if you're interested in getting into this space, sometimes um, you just have to look for the opportunity that is the most kind of logical way for you to, to find your way into the area, whether it's that you work on intellectual property issues and maybe there's a crossover there. For me, it was an opportunity to join the litigation section at the National Security Agency where I was working on counterterrorism, counterintelligence kind of litigation with the Department of Justice. And that was my kind of road from litigation into, into the NSA. But because of the NSA working on a lot of you know, different surveillance op you know, operations and things of that nature, there was obviously a natural component of learning about privacy issues, issues on the Fourth Amendment, a bunch of things that kind of then took me from there to cyber, you know, to cybersecurity because of their work. And then I kind of just naturally marched to where I am now, which, which I'm very fortunate to be in this space and to be doing this in, in the private sector, which is a different way of, of working than obviously what I was doing in the government. But I kind of just took one opportunity to the next and went from being kind of a standard trial lawyer to where I'm, you know, in this really, uh, really fascinating specialized field where I agree with Arson, it's really a privilege to be to be in this space working on these issues. So I would also just say, it shouldn't be discouraging. And also just to look for whatever natural opportunity, you know, some people, they just do this from day one. And I think that's amazing. But other times, you'll just find your natural opportunity to, to open the door and walk, walk into the field. So I, I would agree that you definitely don't need to be a techie, but for me, I would highly recommend that if you do have that curiosity and interest to, to learn about the technology. So for my role, again, I work a lot with um, cloud service providers and um, teams that are deploying various products and services uh, and you know environments in, in, in the cloud. And I find that, especially in, in, in the cloud, I'm, I'm talking about um, Cloud computing, so GCP, Microsoft Azure, AWS, privacy and security are quite interconnected. And it really helps for you, if, especially if you're doing privacy impact assessments, to have that technical knowledge. So personally, I started out uh, with very little technical knowledge, but I did start to learn to code in Python. I also have now some cloud certifications from Azure and, and Google. So if you are interested, I'd recommend it. I would also say that you know, you in this industry, you tend to see uh, individuals that don't like technology and are not interested and are not curious. Um, and you you have the tech folks who find the law and the policy to be boring. So there's this division that's very obvious, and you have this gap in the middle. So if you can somehow switch your way into the middle, um, I think you'll have a lot of opportunities there. I think that's absolutely right, because I think I think you definitely do need the interest in the technology. I 100% agree, I, and I think that curiosity and the interest is is absolutely is is the key. So you're kind of acting as as translators between you know two groups of people that don't necessarily is is that is that what you're kind of hinting towards, or how how would you describe your experience of being in the middle? Yeah, I mean, that, that that's part of my day-to-day -day role, which is um, sometimes actually in companies, it's funny, there's the the technical people sometimes who are in the marketing side who understand how to use cookies or the technologists who want to implement some design. And then there's the in-house compliance attorneys. And sometimes they reach a point where they just don't understand each other. And so I'm sometimes brought in just to explain a legal concept to the tech people and then explain the tech issue to the compliance issue folks as to sort of how they intermarry together and then come up with a unique solution that will make them both happy. Um, and so I um, I either get yelled on on both sides or I make both of them happy. So uh, it's a it's a double edged sword. I agree 100%. I, I both at the agency and 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 where I'm at now, 
on the technical side, you, you know, I would work with some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life to the point at which I, I had to work to understand what they were talking about. I had to have people explain things to me several times to, you know, then kind of pull apart things into their simplest component parts, because, you know, there's a level of talking about that expertise that it can become so complicated that in some cases you can go both ways. You can potentially accidentally think that you're, that there are legal issues where there aren't any. And then you, sometimes you can miss legal issues where there are some. And that's where I think, you know, our sins and, you know, it was exactly right about the translation component and the, I think the critical role that lawyers can play in that space, because I've seen situations on both sides where, you know, you know, a technical understanding of it or, the, or wherever the business is coming from, it can look at an issue and either make it way more complicated than it needs to be or, you know, potentially miss something. And, and that lawyer stepping in the middle, understanding what the regulations and law says can really help. And, and in a lot of cases, I actually see, you know, we're a really productive component, whereas sometimes the, the cliche is to see lawyers as an obstacle, but sometimes, especially if we're brought in at an early stage, it is really easy to... to simplify something that 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 folks can think is incredibly complicated that's creating legal issues where perhaps it's, it's not so you're, you're kind of acting as as mediators and facilitators even we can, we can say that is that fair to say yeah, I mean, I think that's a part of it, uh, of the job is just trying to find out a creative solution that will address both the legal compliance issue and the technical issue. Yeah. And then I'm going to kind of relate this to a question that, that Arman asks in the chat. Let's say you're doing your job right and the company brings you on board from, from day one and we're trying to put privacy by design and we're thinking about all the, you know, um, regulations that exist, stricter and stricter regulations on security safeguards. And the company says, okay, you know what, I'm listening to you and I'm spending, um, I don't know how many millions of dollars on cybersecurity tools. Why do companies still get breached? Well, I mean, uh, with breach issues, I think the, the question is always not if it'll happen, but when it'll happen to you. Um, the, the issue is that these the hackers that are perpetrating these acts they're very sophisticated and sometimes they're ahead of the game. Um, and so you have to always be prepared. Um, and so as a company uh, in anticipation of the breach, you have to make sure you have an incident response plan so that the moment a breach happens, you know exactly what you're supposed to do. Um, and then secondarily, you should do tabletop exercises to ensure that um, you actually play out a scenario and how it's going to play out. And there's also some very big fundamental issues companies need to address, which is, what are they doing a ransomware attack? Do they pay? Do they not pay? How do they involve the FBI in that situation? Um, and the good news is that the FBI is actually there here to help you. Um, you know, I've been in meetings with the FBI and um, they're making a very strong push to the public to involve them in these situations. Um, there were some really big critical infrastructure breaches that happened, which uh, underscored the need for there to be more cooperation between federal agencies and the private sector. And so um, it's going to happen. The, the question is, are you prepared for it? I absolutely agree. And I think the other wrinkle is there are so many, and, and sometimes I think it's healthy to compare because when we look at privacy and cybersecurity and cybersecurity especially, it can it can start to seem like such a unique like niche area that that people can sometimes look at risk assessment in that space differently than you would look at other legal risk. Sometimes that makes sense. And I think sometimes it doesn't in terms of if you're working with a company, you're working with whether it's the board of a company or you're talking to your own you know, business leaders, sometimes analogizing the risk to other risks is helpful. When you think about anti-money laundering, that's something that banks deal with on a, on a and other financial institutions deal with on a sliding scale of risk every day in, in the same kind of way, right? Are they trying to be absolutely perfect so that no illicit actor ever ends up anywhere in their in their kind of financial rails? Of course they are. They're doing the bad, you know, you know, the, the the good actors are acting in good faith to make sure that they're taking every step they can to protect themselves, to report things to the governments as necessary. But realistically, 
it's it's probably not perfect. And that's why you have in that space, and I'm not an expert in that space, but in that space, you would have remedial measures and, and you know ways to deal with things. I think of it in a similar sense in cybersecurity, you're going to need to have like our sense, you're going to need to have an incident response plan, you're going to need to build the best defenses you can, you're going to want to have you know, a lawyer like our send available so that you can work with, you know, if, if something happens so that you can work with things, whether it's outside counsel or what have you, but it's going to happen. You're going to be breached. And just like any risk, the, the key is just making sure you're prepared. And I, and I don't think it reflects, I don't think it's think something that companies should get discouraged about. I think just like any other risk being perfectly defended from it is, is, is just unlikely. And realistically, you're going to do the best you can, and you may stop a lot of them, but just like any other risk, whether whether it's financial crime or environmental issues, you know, whatever it is, you're going to do the best you can to be perfect, but then you're just going to have to have a remediation plan. And just to um, add to this, you know, all the things that you would do to prevent the breaches, like they all come into the picture when, you know, it's time to adjudicate someone's, you know, if, if you were at fault, for example, or if, you know, someone's uh, trying to levy penalties, um, you know, a lot of these laws have due diligence defense. Um, and for example, in Canada, we have cases like Home Depot case where a company does all the right things. They experience, and you know, they show that they took all the measures to um, prevent it, if you will, that they put in place uh, reasonable uh, safeguards. Um, so they, they, they're all valuable and, and they really help companies um, to um, reduce their their damages afterward. So so it's it's about trying and doing doing your best and dealing with the consequences or being ready to you know remediate when things go wrong. That's kind of what I'm understanding. Absolutely. And there's there's lots of good ex examples too, not I of like of situations where companies like like Mingan said said companies were actually and there have been some other documented examples in the US where companies have been able to you know maybe they were breached but they had their systems segmented in a certain way they had you know they were able to contain a breach in a way so that it caused a minimal amount of damage and like that's to me and maybe it's because of my background to me that's that's almost a success story right because it's going to happen and so if you have a system where you actually isolate something incredibly quickly, you limit the damage. To me, that's a, that's actually, I mean, nobody wants to be breached, but that's actually a real success story. It's, it, it, it shows that you're just well-prepared and you're able to you know, compensate the best you can. Yeah. Some issues, it doesn't even involve an outside bad actor. Um, a most common situation of a, a data breach is sometimes an employer. Like there's an employee who wanted to attach a file and send an email and they sent the wrong file to the wrong person that had everybody's medical conditions on it or social security numbers on it. So um, that is something you can very rarely guard against completely. I mean, there's some mitigation measures you can do in advance and training to employees and things of that sort, but it's not entirely unpreventable. Okay, so, so people should keep trying them. While you are going to get breached, there's there's no reason to give up. You know, keep trying at least. We have another question from Karin. It's talking about you know privacy law applying broadly to all types of companies, um, whether or not they deal with consumer information or they deal directly with businesses. Now, why you know how are these laws enforced when you have a business that's that's just B two B? And that's not dealing with consumer data. So are, are privacy laws that as important? Are, are cybersecurity laws important? How do you, what, are, what is your take on it? Yeah, I mean, it, from a U.S. perspective, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, California's privacy law starting January 1st with the CPRA is going to have B2B within scope. So if you collect John Doe, who works at XYZ Corp's email address, his work phone number, and other details about him that are B2B related, um, that's fully in scope and you would have to honor their data privacy rights and give the transparency notices among other things. Um, the four other state privacy laws like Colorado, Virginia, Utah, and Connecticut, they actually exclude from their scope commercial data or B2B type of data and HR data. Um, so there is a demarcation line, but internationally, um, like whether you're talking about EU's privacy law, GDPR, 
uh, the 35 privacy laws in Africa, in Middle East and Asia, usually B2B is in scope. There is usually not a limitation on, and it's, the data needs to be for um, some type of a household or individual uh, capacity, like a D2C. Um, and so when you're dealing with even business contact information, it's important to safeguard them, to uh, honor privacy rights. And even if you're in the states where uh, B2B is not in scope, it's still a good idea to at a minimum safeguard them, but it definitely think about um, some minimal privacy protections, at least such as a confidentiality provision, a contract, or um, just being privacy forward in that sphere. So in Canada, um, we currently, we don't consider, for example, business contact information to be a personal information. So um, the risk is um, a lot less because privacy laws are protecting personal information. And it's a matter of how does the applicable law define personal information? So as Arsen said, in, in the EU, you'll have um, business contact information coming to the picture um, and, and uh, in California, for example, as well, but not the case for us here for now. <laughs> and and that's where not you can also see some of the, like you said, the some of the security laws um, and the security provisions from privacy, you know, some of the security laws playing a bigger role, whether it's um, here we have, you know, the new critical infrastructure law that it's not 100% final yet because we haven't defined what critical infrastructure entities are, are going to be considered to be. But, you know, we have other cybersecurity laws also globally, like the NIST framework in Europe, which applies to a wide variety of businesses, financial institutions, et cetera. And it contains many requirements, including supply chain security requirements and encryption requirements and a variety of different things that, you know, you would have to be cognizant of even if you were dealing with the B2B kind of data. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not that there, you know, is in a role for some of these, uh, you know, frameworks. Well, for sure. Um, one other point I want to flag and maybe add on on this is most companies have employees. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but most privacy laws will consider employee data within scope. So even, even you know, laws that include exclude business contact information, like you're a B2B company, you have a thousand employees, you're responsible for the, you know, tax forms and social security numbers of a thousand people, right? Yeah, and again, in that context, it, it varies, at least from a US perspective, it varies. Um, in California, HR data is in scope. And so you would give a privacy notice and honor privacy rights vis-a-vis um, -vis your employees where you're the controller of the data and your data subjects are the employees. Um, the other four state privacy laws won't have that, although there are employment laws that could provide certain privacy protections, like in their labor codes of the laws, uh, but not from a comprehensive privacy law standpoint. But of course, in Europe, um, B2B, HR, it's all in scope. Um, it's just one GDPR law that applies across the board, of course, with member state laws also that have very specific rules regarding employee monitoring in the workplace and other rights that they want to extend that are more stringent than the GDPR. I'm kind of sad because I'm seeing the time fly and I think I could sit and ask you questions for the next five hours. Uh, maybe we'll leave the substantive stuff a little bit behind and if people want substantive classes, they can look at part one as well. And maybe we'll do a part three. Just it's, it's, it's honestly been a blast, but maybe we can leave our, you know, uh, younger attorneys that are listening with, with some advice, you know, let's, let's say there's a second year attorney listening to us. There's somebody who's still in, in you know, third year of law school or, somebody who's been practicing for some time in, in corporate law or in litigation. And they're wondering, how do I kind of, they, they think your careers are fun. You know, you convince them. Um, what, what are some tips and tricks, you know, or maybe certifications or is, is this a good place to be right now? It's a, it's a very good place to be right now. I, I couldn't tell you how, uh, limited the market is, at least in the U.S., for data privacy attorneys. We often struggle to hire talent because there just isn't enough people out there with the capability to do this. 
Um, so it's definitely a great area to get into. It, the demand is growing even more every day, every year with new laws passing. Um, I think if you wanted to get into this field, um, the one thing I'll say is you have to view it sort of academically. It requires a lot of studying. Um, it's something where there are certification courses you can take. Um, my recommendation would be to go to the IAPP.org website. Um, there are the CIPP series of exams along with the CIPM and CIPT. And um, those CIPP series teach you about certain countries' privacy laws, such as CIPP US would be the US privacy law and actually write the exam questions for that one. And then there's a CIPP C for Canada and then A for Asia and E for EU. Um, so I would recommend going there, buying a book, um, maybe starting with the US. If you're in US or if you're in Canada, get the the Canadian book for that and um, you know, do some study, read it, see if you're interested in it, uh, talk to other privacy attorneys, um, but definitely try to learn the fundamentals initially and then look for a different avenue to get into the career because there's a diff there are different options. Like if you wanted to go into the private sector route, you know, you can go in-house or you can be at a law firm. If you're more in the government side, you know, at least from a US perspective, you could work for the California Attorney General's Office or the Attorney General's Office of the other states with privacy laws, um, along with the California Privacy Protection Agency. Um, and then on the public interest side, um, you know, if you work for an organization that dealt with privacy issues, um, you know, representing consumers, maybe on the plaintiff side, um, you know, that's something to look into. Um, but definitely try a couple of things, uh, especially for, for a second year, do some internships. Um, and see if you actually like it and, and do a little bit of studying on it or take a course. Yeah, I think it's a great, a great field to get into right now. There's, and it's only continuing to grow. I, you know, this is not, you know, we've obviously seen an explosion of new laws and new regulations. That's also one of the things I could have mentioned that I, that I love about this job is every day learning about new things that are coming down the pike, right? Like a new cybersecurity registration framework in Singapore or a new set of privacy laws in X, Y, and Z place. And that's a lot of fun to me. I'm a huge law nerd. I love, I love learning new things. And, I, and the, the idea of being on the cutting edge of things, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these issues, you're not going to look at Westlaw and be doing case research because there are no cases, right? And it's, and, it, and that's, you know, that can be a little, for, especially for someone who used to be a trial lawyer and did a lot of that, that can be a little unnerving, but it's also really exciting to, to say that, you know, you're trying to figure things out in, in a really dynamic environment. Um, the other thing I'd say is I, I love what I'm doing in the private sector right now, but also there's a lot of unique opportunities in the government. I'm sure this, this is true in Canada too, but I really, it was incredibly rewarding and incredibly interesting to be dealing with, you know, issues of analyzing privacy expectations under the fourth amendment in the United States when I was working in the federal government, working on some really interesting, um, you know, surveillance and, and just kind of a variety of foreign intelligence issues. Those, those can materialize in all kinds of organizations in the U S government, like the FBI, DOJ, in addition to kind of obviously the federal trade commission, which is, uh, you know, another place where on the federal level, there's a lot of privacy enforcement work being done and kind of enforcement of, the Federal Trade Commission Act, where, um, you know, and I know some people who've worked there who have had just a wonderful experience uh, doing that. So those are different ways of, of kind of practicing on the public interest side, one more on the kind of government enforcement, whether it's criminal or other kind of space, where you're dealing with some of these issues, and one on the more kind of traditional privacy enforcement side, but there's a lot of value in those opportunities too. And, and like Arsene indicated, keep an eye out for internships, I know a lot of federal government agencies, almost all of them now, this wasn't true when I came out of law school, almost all of them have honors programs and intern programs. So I would add that when looking for positions, don't just type privacy lawyer on, on LinkedIn. So there's, um, the titles are, are very diverse. So you could be a, a data officer, um, a privacy director, a chief of, chief of you know, data and privacy. So don't just uh, rely on the word lawyer. Um, and there are a lot of companies that would say that you could take the job, but then they'll give you time to actually get certified. So they would say that, you know, within the six time, six months of taking the job that we expect you to, for example, have a CIPPC or CIPP US. Um, again, in, given the nature of our job that it's constantly changing, I would also recommend that you sign up for 
newsletters um, and digests. They are free through the IAPP. So if you go again to IAPP.org in the news section, you can sign up. So that at least you become used to the vocabulary and the issues in the news while you're studying. So very dynamic space is, is what I understand. And also another thing that I heard was that the laws are constantly changing. Would you feel there's a big difference between somebody who's been in the space for six months, five years, 10 years, 20 years, if there's such a thing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think where uh, experience long-term comes into play is understanding the modules. Um, I think with data privacy, there are certain concepts and principles that remain as bedrocks, no matter how much the law changes and how much, and no matter which country's law you're looking at. Like I can take the law of Senegal right now and read it and understand it because if it's in English at least. Uh, and the reason for that is because they're all based on very similar concepts of who are the players in the ecosystem and how are their rights and obligations delineated. So I think that's where experience kicks in and also experience in dealing with different situations. Um, like as Christian mentioned, this is not an area of law where you pull up West law and you start researching case law. It, it's really just from past experience that you know how to advise a client and just seeing different scenarios and how they play out. So even though the law changes, like when the change does happen, you read what the change was to adapt it to prior practices and modules they used to implement for compliance. And so I think experience definitely does play, but the fact that it does change is good for new people coming in because they could start fresh with a new law and really see how it developed. That's great. And thank you for sharing that insight. I don't know if anybody has any concluding remarks. I see we're at the top of the hour. I wanna let our panelists, if they wanna leave our audience with some last words of wisdom before we wrap this up. Privacy is not dead, it's hiring from the IFPP. I couldn't have said anything better. So I think we'll leave it at that. I mean, yeah, that sounds right. private. Yeah, privacy is really hot right now. So think about it if you're interested in the field. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. It was really a, a privilege to get to listen to you and, and to uh, to take in all your insights about the practice. Uh, can I invite our audience and attendees to connect with you on you know LinkedIn, Twitter, if you're still there after the Elon takeover, or you know whatever other social media platforms you might be on? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. It was a truly a pleasure to get to listen to you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Until, until next Thank time. You.